Okay, so what's on the menu for today? Okay, so um, the, the, the first thing is to try to fix a, a really big, clear, but easy to fix mistake that uh, I, I, I stated last time. I stated something incorrectly last time. And, and, and my excuse for having made this mistake is that I was, I, I was very interested in some special behavior and I ignored, I, I got the, I misstated the generic behavior. So let's, let's try to make the context clear. So the context is that we're talking about Z mod three torsors. over um, o -o -o over the the rational numbers and um, and and these are interesting to analyze because of the fact that the group Z mod three does not split over the rationals. Uh, it doesn't split until we get to the Eisenstein field, the Eisenstein rationals, mm -hmm. um, which means that perhaps by this philosophy of descent or something like that, that you've been trying to tell me about, that we're going to algebraically push forward these torsors uh, that initially live over the rational field. We're going to push them forward till they live over the Eisenstein field where their behavior will be easier to analyze. And um, so, I mean, how do, how do we, right, I guess we push them forwards and, and it makes sense to, to push them forward to get a Z, a Z mod three torsor over the um, Eisenstein field. Hmm? So that's sort of push forward process. And um, and and right, and those really are easy to understand um, because you know the fact that Z mod three, the group Z mod three splits over the um, Eisenstein field. So uh, that means that to classify the Z mod three torsors over the Eisenstein field, you're basically just taking cube roots of, um, of, of, of numbers in the Eisenstein field. And you're, and, and if you, it, and, and it doesn't matter if you change them up to a, a cubic factor, it's, it's still giving you the same Z mod three torsor. Um, but this is very non-surjective. So it creates a, 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 a it creates a question of um, what's the image, what's the image of this, and um, and so I, th I I think I stated correctly that the image of this is um, is is that it's the ones that it's it, it's it's these it, it it's these Z mod three torsors over the Eisenstein field that correspond to taking the cube root of a special kind of number. And that special kind of number is um, is a number f. Well, I can't think of right best letter to use. Um, uh, let me just call it x for now, I guess. So if X is equal to X squared, and then take the Eisenstein conjugate of that. And if this holds up to, if this equation holds up to cube factors, then, um, then, th then this kind of Z mod three torsor is 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 coming from one that lives over the rational. So it's in the image of this push forward map. Um, 
And I think that's correct, but you know, we, we, we still wanna clarify that and understand it in very Tanakhian ways, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But- um, This X here was the, <clears throat> that was the number you were talking about when you said that Zedmod three torsors over the Eisenstein field amount to cube roots of numbers up to some of the coolance relation. That, that's right. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. That's right. That's okay. right. Uh huh. That's right. And um. And 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 you know, and one way I described this was I said that if you got this Z mod three tours are over the Eisenstein field, you can also right. I mean, so that's giving you a cubic extension of the Eisenstein field, but the Eisenstein field is itself a quadratic extension of the rational field. So when you compose those two extensions, you're getting a sixth degree extension. And you can ask about the nature of that sixth degree extension. And um, I think I stated incorrectly last time that there were basically two possibilities. I think I said that this sixth degree extension would always be a Galois extension and that the Galois group would always be you know, uh, one of the two six element groups, which, you know, if it is a Galois extension, it's got a Galois group, it's a six element Galois group because it's a sixth degree extension, then yeah, it has to be one of the two six element groups, either Z mod six, which is what it is in this case that we're interested in, or the only po other possibility would be the group three bank. And um, the, the problem with that was that I was, I was wrong in saying that it, it, it's, it's got to be a Galois extension. It, it's typically not a Galois extension at all. So I completely misstated the generic behavior. The generic behavior is that it's not a Galois extension. Uh -huh. um, and, and, then it and then there are two ways that that generic behavior can degenerate. Uh, and, and one way is that it gives us these Z mod, these Z mod, these, these Z mod three torsors that originally live over the rationals, which we can also more or less identify with the Z mod six torsors. Uh, that, that incorporate the Eisenstein Z mod two torsor. Um, uh, but, but, so, yeah. So, so let's 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 try to say. Are you doing this right? How how do I get to the next page? Lower right. Maybe you you need to turn the page or something. Oh wow, well, maybe oh, that's weird. I don't remember that before. Okay, it could be I'm screwing up, but it worked. Okay, so um, so you know when you take cube root of x, uh, Well, right. Let me try. Let me try to describe what happens in the generic case where it's not a Galois extension. Okay. So first of all, let me mention. Let me mention when I. Let me mention what is my intuition about what a normal subgroup is, but I want to contrast it to an intuition that somebody else I know told me about. They told me a completely different intuition about what a normal subgroup is. So of course, my intuition about what a normal subgroup is, is that it corresponds to a quotient group. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one of my first professors in abstract algebra told me this different intuition that they had, which was, they thought of it in terms of Galois theory, and they thought of it in terms of, uh, you know, that the, the normal subgroups 
in the Galois correspondence, the normal subgroups correspond to the normal extensions or the Galois extensions or something like that, which are basically the splitting fields. And, and the basic idea of splitting fields is that if you include one quantity in the extension, then you have to include all the other quantities that are the solution to the same equation. In other words, you have to include all the conjugate quantities. You know, so it's it, 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 it's a normal extension or a Galois extension or whatever it's called is 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 very analogous to a normal subgroup in the sense that in the sense that you have to include all the conjugates. Um, <laughs> conjugates are different. You know. A pun on conjugates. <laughs> Yes, yeah. yes, but I think it must be more than a pun. I think there must be some history to this thing. Yeah, uh-huh. Um, that it, you know, the, yeah. the technology all sort of fits together. So, so the, the, the you know, the, the so in general, we're going to be taking, you know, the the cube root of x and x is going to be equal to something like uh, a plus b times one to the one third. So that's an Eisenstein quantity. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you want to make that into a, a, a normal thing, a normal extension, a Galois extension, then you have to include all of the other roots of the same equation. And so, like you know, so if we're if we're starting from the rationals, we're taking a normal extension of the rationals, then you know we're going to include one to the one third, because it's going to, this is going to be extension that in, incorporates the Eisenstein subfield as well. So we're going to have to include one to the one third. Well, I guess that automatically includes one to the two thirds, but but the point is that. You know, if you're going to take the cube root of this x, you have to take the cube root of its conjugate x as well, right? You'd have to take both the cube root of a plus b times one to the one third, and you'd have to take the cube root of a plus b times one to the two thirds. So you'd be taking this cubic extension, and I think this is a completely independent cubic extension. So you're going to be you know, taking Q, you're starting from the Eisenstein extension, which is already quadratic, and then you're performing these two cubic extensions. And, um, you know, I think that's basically going to give us an 18 dimensional extension over the rationals or nine dimensional extension over the Eisenstein field. Right? I mean, you can sort of picture this, right? I mean, you've got the Eisenstein field, and then you've got some uh, number. And if you want to take its cube root, you have to take the cube root of the other one as well. And so you're going to have, you know, the three cube roots of this one and the three cube roots of this one. And so it's going to give you a ninth degree extension. And so I think that means that, you know, this whole 18 dimensional Galois group is going to be the wreath product of Z mod two and Z mod three, or in other words, right, it's gonna be the semi-direct product of uh, Z mod two acting on, uh, on Z mod three squared. Does that seem sensible? Sorry, say, say that again. So Z mod two is acting on? On this Cartesian square of Z mod three. What's the Cartesian square of Z mod three? You're claiming that's the Galois group of this. I'm saying that each time we each, you know, we have these two different cube, two different things we're going to take cube roots of. They happen to be conjugate to each other, though. 
under the Eisenstein conjugation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, each of them is giving us a factor of Z mod three uh, in th those cubic extensions. You're saying that the Galois group of that repeated cubic extension is Z mod two square, Z mod three square? Yes, yes, o o over the Eisenstein field, uh -huh. right? But if we back up and look at it as an extension over the rational field, then it's going to be this semi-direct product or this wreath product. I'm willing to believe it. Um, I don't... <laughs> well, I, there's a lot of details I didn't check very carefully. I, because, I, again, I mean, uh, let, let me emphasize my philosophy here. My philosophy here is that I was really interested in the special case. You know, the special case... Uh, where it, where it ended up being instead of this eighteen element subgroup, it ended up being a Gawa extension, and it was Z mod six, and you know, so I got that part right. I just misstated the generic background, but it is very, it, you know, there's a lot of lessons to be learned from thinking about this whole generic situation. Um, I'm not necessarily going to try to do it very carefully um right now but i think it's it's interesting to think about so so you know let's try to let's try to think about the intuition of this okay uh -huh. so um so can you go to a new page here <laughs> you're gonna have my official page turn yeah uh so you know let me draw a little picture of z mod three squared here okay That's supposed to be picture of Z mod three. So this is supposed to be the two axes right here that have. Mm -hmm. And you know, the action of the Eisenstein conjugation on this is just to switch the two axes. Yeah. But now let's think about let's think about Z mod two invariant subgroups of this. Uh huh. And what are they? Well, for example, the diagonal. Yes. The, the diagonal. That's right. That's right. And for the, for that subgroup, you know, if if if, if right, for, not only is the diagonal subgroup fixed, but it's pointwise fixed which is right. a stronger condition. So that semi-direct product is going to be abelian, and that's that Z mod six. So it's that diagonal that's giving us that one that we're really interested in. But have you got any other interesting Z mod two invariant subgroups here? Well, I mean, there's the boring ones, which are the trivial group and the whole group. Right, right, right. Yeah. Latter one is not pointwise fixed. That's right. And are there any others? Uh, let me see if I can try to come up with a weirder one. If there is one. Um, uh, <laughs> um, It looks like I could take the group that I just described, the diagonal group, yeah, and throw in two more elements, like the reverse diagonal. Is that true? <laughs> I don't think that's going to be a subgroup, but I like the idea of taking the reverse diagonal. You mean this thing right here? No, no. I meant the oh, big oh, reverse. Oh, diagonal. what do you mean? Okay. So two more. The, the upper right point and the lower left point. Seems like that's a subgroup. Am I really confused? <laughs> uh, what am I doing? 
probably it's really something dumb. To think. It's probably something dumb. Uh, probably no, never mind. Never mind. It's not. Never mind. Yeah, it doesn't look like the right size to be a subgroup. Yeah. Uh, can you tell me if there are more? <laughs> yeah, there is one. Okay. It's it's like uh, well, let's see. You know, it's got to have. It, okay, so it's got to have three elements, right? Yes. Yes, okay. that's right. If it's a non-trivial subgroup. Neither the whole thing nor those nothing. So, so why is it so hard? Um, right, right. I mean, and this is the. Can I give a hint? Uh, only or you just want to think about it. I shouldn't even need. Sure. Can you erase that diagonal thing that's just like this distracting me right now? The diagonal thing, that thing. Yeah, I just rather. Okay. Not have that on my mind. Okay. So, so let's see. I will try to figure it out. <laughs> so, so it's a three. You're claiming there's another three element invariant subgroup. Yeah. And so, since it's three element, it has to be Z mod three abstractly. So it has to be generated by one element. Yeah. And that one element can't be on the diagonal because that's one we already. Did right, and so okay, so it's got to. I guess you're allowed to draw on this whiteboard, right? Go ahead. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I didn't even. I forget. Ah, what happened? I think you went to a new page. Okay. 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 Well, yeah, I think I know what it is. Let me take finally take advantage of my ability to draw. Let's see. Why can't I? Yeah, I don't know what color this is going to turn out to be, but right. I want, I want this guy here and this guy here. Yeah. Uh huh. So, and the third one is the identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Yeah, sorry. This is not very pretty, but okay. <laughs> right. I mean, one way I was thinking about this was that you know we're 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 kind of looking at the projective line over the three element field. Uh, you know, as 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 a this looks like the affine line over the three element. Well, it looks like the affine plane over the three. I'm oh, sorry, that's what I mean. oh. you make the projective line from that by the one element, the, the one dimensional subspaces, and so there's four subspaces: the two axes, the diagonal, and this fourth one that you just drew. Uh huh. And uh, you know, for this fourth one. The action is, um, you know, it's it's pointwise fixed. It's, sorry, it's, the subgroup is fixed. The three element subgroup is fixed, but it's not pointwise fixed. It's right. so so you know this is the one that gives three bang. So this yeah. this so this is what happens when you correspond. You know this is this is what happened. Remember we had a plus b times one to the one third, and we took cube root of that. But if b is zero. That's this de de degeneration, this subgroup of the six element subgroup of the 18 element wreath product. Uh, so it is non abelian. And uh, right, and so, it, right, I mean, that's that's the one, like, you know, if, you know, so that's like if you're taking the cube root of seven or the cube root of two or something like that. Uh, and, and And that's how. The Galois group manages to completely permute all three cube roots of, for example, seven or two or something like that. Uh, I don't know how you're. I don't know how you're getting all this stuff. So, so let's see. So, what are you saying? Uh, so, so one thing you're saying is that. Okay, I'm catching up with you. So, one thing you're saying is that this this subgroup. Okay, when you form this semi-direct product, yes, this particular subgroup, since it's you're going to get the yeah, since it's since Zima three is acting non-trivially on this subgroup, you're getting non-abelian six-element group, and so that basically is three bang, and then. 
So then That's you're just, right. And so then you're just going to try to dream up some cubic extensions of the Eisensteins, whose Galois group over the rationals is three bang. And you're doing that just by, uh, you're doing that just by like guessing it or something. <laughs> so yes, sort of. But re remember, the, the the ones we were really interested in had the property that x is equal to x squared conjugate. Or I guess you prefer writing it as you know putting the conjugate on one side and the square on the other side. And this is up to cube factors, up, up to cube cube factors or something like that. Uh -huh. But but the these other ones like the cube root of seven right those are x equals to x x conjugate equals x without the exponent and perhaps up to cube factors uh, right and 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 so you know the the, the x it turns out, for some strange reason, that the ones with you know the the conjugate is equal to squaring. That's the diagonal, and that's this that's that very abelian one. Whereas the ones where it's the conjugate is equal to x itself, that's this off diagonal one that you drew in in black. Uh huh. So I'm not saying I completely understand this, but I'm saying it's very suggestive. It's very suggestive the way the generic group, the generic Galois group here. You know, when you make it into a, a, you complete it to a normal extension, a Galois extension, and it ends up being an 18th degree extension. And in, in the generic case, that's going to give us that wreath, 18 element wreath product. But then there are going to be these special degenerate cases. And it's very interesting that, you know, the degenerate degenerate cases that we're getting correspond to these two non-trivial invariant Z, Z mod two invariant subgroups of the Cartesian square of Z mod three. So, I mean, for example, you know, I, I, I was idly thinking about analogs of this, you know, instead of supposing instead of taking cube roots, supposing we were taking fifth roots or something like that, then I was trying to figure out, well, what are all the degenerate case is going to be in that in in that example and i thought it'd be fun i'm not i'm not proposing to do it right now but i thought it'd be fun to you know analyze all the degenerate cases in a, in a situation like this and that there'd be a lot to learn from uh -huh. from understanding that analysis that analysis into degenerate cases versus the generic case and the way these de degenerate cases correspond to subgroups. So, like, right, I mean, right. One of one of my big mistakes from last time, right, is, you know, I said something like that the generic case is the three bang, and the special case is the Z mod six. And right, we're supposed to appreciate appreciate now how what 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 how stupid it was for me to say that, uh, because it's right. It seems like there's this much better philosophy that says that instead of the degenerate case corresponding to a subgroup of the same size, the degenerate case should right. correspond to a subgroup. Oh, and well, yeah, go ahead. Of some larger group, yeah, which is the generic group. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's true. I even thought that was weird, but I didn't. Right, I, I, right. I, mean, I, 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 I thought that's what you were hinting at last time. I thought that's part of what you were hinting at. <laughs> well, okay. Um, so I thought you'd like this. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, yeah, so, like I say, I don't it's funny that it seems like generically two times three is 18. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. That's yeah. I, so it's some wreath product formula, yeah. something uh -huh. like that. Uh, Something like that. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I don't, I, like I say, I don't understand this completely, but I can see enough patterns. I can see that there's some things, uh -huh. very things going on here. And in particular, I think, you know, I'm trying to claim that there's sort of propaganda here along the lines of, along the lines of teaching us 
how arithmetic geometry, you know, the Galois theory aspect of, of arithmetic geometry really is geometric. You know, it's not just this completely cryptic arithmetic thing. It, it, it when, when we really understand it, we should really, in some sense, really understand it as being ge geometric in the sense that, for example, there are these generic cases, and then there are these like symmetry axes that act as special degenerate cases. And, you know, the, the way in which these symmetry axes, right? I mean, right, this is like a symmetry axis right here. And this is a different symmetry axis. And these are different special cases of, you know, degenerate uh -huh. cases degenerating from the generic behavior. And the way in which we're supposed to appreciate these things as being, you know, degenerate symmetry axes is, is somewhat obscured by the fact that, you know, these equations just hold up to cube factors. But nevertheless, I think it's, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of lessons hidden in here about how to really think of arithmetic geometry in a geometric way. And here's another thing that you pointed out last time. One of the things you pointed out last time, and I don't understand this, but it's again, an interesting thing to think about is you pointed out that if you insist on being on this symmetry axis without aid from the cubic factors, then, then there was like a unique solution over in this case, which was, or almost unique solution, which was something like uh, X equals one to one third. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, or x or one to the two thirds as well, but but on the other hand, write this other symmetry axis. This other symmetry axis. Mm -hmm. I, I'm having a little bit of trouble with the whiteboard here, but let's see if it gets to work. It's like you know it moved again or something like that. Let's see. Oh, I moved my whiteboard. Oh, well, that, maybe that book looks like a horrible. <laughs> so I'm, it's really a problem. Yeah. I moved my whiteboard without it affecting you. Uh, sorry. Uh, maybe when we go to the next page, it'll be okay. Uh, I got to move my whiteboard a little bit. I was just trying to grab something, and so I moved it out of the way. Oh no, this is bad. Okay, let's try. <laughs> let's try a new page. See if that does something. Okay, but can you go back to the? The, the previous page, and I'll try to just finish up the previous page. Okay. <laughs> Let's see if this will work. Okay. I'll try. Um, I, I was, you know, pointing to this example right here. That's not bad. Um, yeah. And um, so, yeah, you're saying that what? So, I mean, seven is a number with X yeah, bar. Yeah, right. They're, they're all real, all the original real or rational numbers, all the original rational numbers, real rational numbers, uh -huh. uh, strictly satisfy, strictly live on that symmetry axis. So it's, there's something funny about the, the difference between these two symmetry axes that one of them is uh, oh. yeah. highly populated even at the strict level, whereas the other one really gets its power from, you know, ho holding up to cubic factors as far as oh, I can yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it would be, yeah, so that would make it fun to examine another case. <laughs> that's right, that's right, that's right. So like I say, I was idly thinking about the case of, you know, fifth roots instead of cube roots or something like that, but I didn't, I, I, I didn't really think about that much more. But let's try to go to new page here now. Yeah, in fact, here it is, okay. Okay. So, um, We'll see how this goes. Uh, so, so I, I want to I want to emphasize another idea that you brought up last time here. Um, I mean, there are so many different directions we can go here, but uh, I, I want to emphasize something that you mentioned last time. I think. Uh, so, you know, when we were talking about this whole idea of torsors from the Tanakhian viewpoint. We mentioned that we were trying to sketch out the theory 
of a um, sketch out the theory of a, a Z mod three mm -hmm. torsor, uh, and and you know starting at the, from a level where it doesn't split. So we're you know we're, we're talking about doing it from over the rationals, not over the Eisenstein field where it splits. And um, so so uh, you know we started out sketching it by saying something like we're going to have the theory of an Eisenstein line object L. So L is going to be an Eisenstein line object. And then we're going to have a, we're going to have its third Eisenstein uh, tensor power. And then we're going to have a trivialization of that. So in other words, we're going to have an Eisenstein linear map from from the Eisenstein object itself. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, um, and and this was, right, this was just the start of a sketch of the theory. And then, you know, by the descent philosophy, we had to figure out there was some extra structure on this. But you pointed out that it's sort of interesting to just stop at this point right here and take this as the definition of an independent theory. So, you know, we could call this, this is the, I mean, what, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what, what the, well, first of all, you, you keep on reminding me that we want this to be invertible. So I'm putting a little ghost arrow pointing in the other direction, meaning that it's invertible. So it's a, it's a trivialization of the third tensor power. And, um, So this is a this is a um, a theory all by itself and has its its own models. And Well, and, and it's interesting. It's interesting to think about this theory. I'm also at the moment. I'm sort of staring at this theory and thinking about its models, thinking of like the stack of models, models of this theory, the moduli stack of models of this theory, and wondering if those different levels of degeneracy that we saw, whether those would show up as different isotropy subgroups in the moduli stack. But I'm, I'm not even sure that that's the right way to think about it. Um, but, but let, 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 let me focus on something that's interesting about this theory. So again, you did sort of suggest last time thinking about this theory, uh -huh. the theory in its own right. And uh, so what I wanted to clarify is uh, something that I, that I mentioned about this theory when you brought it up last time, which is I, I was suggesting that this is sort of in a certain way analogous to the tangent bundle. Um, uh -huh. Did, did that did that make any sense when I said it, or does it make any sense now? Did you? Um, I, I, I want to explain more about what I meant by that, but I don't know if it's already completely clear to you what it. Do you mean the whole theory and it's like the tangent bundle, not like E is like the tangent bundle, <laughs> right? This whole theory. Well, actually, okay, okay. E is sort of like. I'll just say something stupid, which is like E is sort of like the dual numbers because it's the same. Yes, size. that's right. That's right. That's right. So yeah, yes. It, it, we're we're sort of we're sort of using the spectrum of E as an exponent, just like you might use the spectrum of the dual numbers as an exponent. That's right. That's right. Or you know, so if you since using the spectrum of the dual numbers as an exponent, you might, uh, sometimes I call the dual numbers a co-exponent. And similarly here, you know, it's the spectrum of E that is the exponent. So E is sort of like the co-exponent. But there's a there's a sort of decategorification level slip going on here. And I'm I'm probably a little bit confused by this because I'm not sure how, I'm not sure how thoroughly I understand 
the categorified theory of exponentials. Um, but let's pursue it a little bit here. So I guess yeah, I, I guess I'm trying to say that the kind of exponentiation that we're doing here, I think it is, it, you know, it, it is somewhat categorified compared to the, the tangent bundle example. Uh, there might be some tricky way to is avoid having to think of it as categorified. When you say exponentiation, yes. you mean that you're, well, I exponentiate something and get a new something. So I'm confused about what you're exponentiating. So let me guess. Yes. Did, Do you want to write it down? Go ahead. Yes. Wrong. You could be like starting with some theory and then throwing in this extra structure here that you've put in the blue box and get a new theory and that might be the exponential of the original theory is that what it is or can you say that again <laughs> or write so it down you, or say it again. yeah so it could be that you're starting with some theory x yes unspecified theory x yes and you're putting it then you're building a new theory by yes. taking x and throwing in in the way that one can throwing in an eisenstein line object e and this object l and all this stuff in the blue box so now you have like you've thrown this stuff in the blue box into the sketch of the old theory x and now you get a new theory so that would is that what you're talking about or is that completely different i'm i'm not I'm not, I, I'm just not sure you described it correctly because I'm not sure you really made it sound analogous to the tangent bundle. No, uh, I didn't make it sound. I just made it sound like it's a pro. When you said exponentiation, you didn't say like, what sort of X are you exponentiating? And then what is the resulting exponentiated thing? You just well, wrote some blue box here. So so let's, let's, let's try to, you know, let's try to do two parallel columns here. Okay. So, okay. uh, uh, Let's uh, let let's 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 do you know uh, on the left hand side. Let's do uh, let's say spec of commutative ring A to the power of spec of the dual numbers of D is equal to the tangent bundle of um, spec A. And um, over on the right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do <laughs> I'm going to do, let's see, spec of T to the power of spec of E. E is going to stand for Eisenstein, but it's going to, it's going to be a little bit tricky. So let me, let me try to write down what the trickiest thing is. The trickiest thing is that this, you know, over on the left hand side, we're doing a decategorified example. Uh huh. And whereas over on the right hand side, we're doing a categorified example. Sorry. My spelling is not great there. Okay. Um, so, in in uh, I, so what, what do we mean by decategorified versus categorified? So A and D are supposed to be commutative rings, mm -hmm. whereas T and E are supposed to be theories in our doctrine. In other words, they're supposed to be categorified commutative rings, or what we call sometimes we call them two rigs, or sometimes we call them total two rigs, or something like that. But okay. that's how this analogy is going. Okay, we've got commutative rings and their spectrums in the left-hand column. Whereas in the right-hand column, we have categorified commutative rings and their spectrums. 
So let me do a very particular example for the commuter of rang A, okay? Let's mm -hmm. have commuter of, the commuter of rang A, let's, let's have it be, well, I'll work over like the real numbers or something like that. And I'll say, let's take the real numbers that join X and Y and modulo X squared plus Y squared equals one. Yep. So roughly speaking, that's like the, the circle or it's, it's spectrum is the circle. That's the ring of functions on the circle. And, um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to write down We're going to write down. Well, first of all, try to try to look at that language. That's a presentation of a commutative ring. Try to think of it as describing exactly what a model of that commutative ring looks like, or as a point of its spectrum. Uh, you know, so it's saying right. It, it, it's saying x is a number, y is a number, and x squared plus y squared equals equal to one. And that's like what a a model of, of this theory is model of this decategorified theory, a point of the spectrum of the ring. Yep. That's like a model in the classical universe, a model in the world of classical numbers. But now we want to write down a new theory whose model is not a classical model of the, of the original theory, but is this model that lives in a certain alternative universe. And that alternative universe is the world of dual numbers, right? So we've got to say, we're going to have the theory of, uh, well, okay, the original thing says take a quantity X, but now I'm supposed to say, you know, one of these alternative quantities X. So an alternative quantity X is, it's like, you know, it looks like uh, perhaps X, one plus x two. No, let me call it x one plus. I'll call. Does that work? X one plus x d times d and x no y1 plus y sub d times d so these are like two you know alternative quantities quantities that live in this alternative universe and um and then, you know, modulo this relation that says x1 plus xd times d squared plus y1 plus y sub d times d squared is equal to I guess is equal to one, but it's sort of like, right? You have to think of that as the alternative one, but fortunately the alternative one really looks a whole lot like the original one, right? Uh -huh. It's like one plus zero times D or something like that. Now, I, I, I mean, somehow this, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm making up this notation as, uh, making up this notation as I'm going along. So I'm not sure how well it's working as notation, but I think you see what I mean, right? I mean, maybe I shouldn't have really, maybe I shouldn't have really included, uh, you know, I should maybe I shouldn't have written the D there and the D there or something like that. It's more like I'm, I'm introducing these four separate variables, X1, XD, and Y1, and YD. Yeah. Right? I mean, what I'm trying to write down is I'm trying to write down this idea of create a new theory whose model 
is a, a model of which is a model of the original theory, but in this alternative universe. So in other words, you know, if, if, if the original theory was made out of quantities, the new theory has to be made out of alternative quantities. And if the original theory, the quantities satisfied some equation, then in the modified theory, the, the alternative quantities have to satisfy this alternative version of the original equations. And that's how you, that's how you algebraically create the tangent bundle. Are we, and now, we, yeah? are we looking at models of, the, of this new theory in the real numbers, that is homomorphisms of this from? This yes, yeah, yes, but really we're, we're, I mean, really we're looking at models anywhere. But uh, well, like in the real numbers. Yes. Right. Well, a, a model, I, can, I, can, yeah. uh, I can imagine interpreting XD as a real number. Um, I can't imagine interpreting XD times D as a real number very successfully because that's a quantity that squares to zero. Yeah, I I I thought I th I thought I sort of admitted that. I thought I sort of admitted that I was, you know, that this notation was a little bit dodgy. I tried to I tried to say that, you know, really these are the variables. X, you know, the, the Yeah. Okay. So I mean you could also stick in your relations that d squared equals zero, right? I mean, do you want to do that? How does this theory know that d squared is zero? Well, I mean, there there are rules for how you expand this thing out here. So it is the right the definition. Uh, sorry, the, the definition of this right. The definition of this is that you know, sort of by by definition of how the dual numbers works when you write x one plus yeah yeah well, okay. But it sounds like you're this is this is what I call formalization. Uh, this is you know how do you how do you, how you know how do you take this formal dual numbers thing and how do you formally square it well you use the rules of the dual numbers to write it down what were you going to say well it seems if you are if this is supposed to be the presentation of a ring yes you'd want to stick in the relation d squared equals zero into the presentation and that would get the job done uh but but d is not a <laughs> i really screwed up by making it seem like d is a a, a a a a a one of the generators. It's not. It's this auxiliary thing that just formally exists. And <laughs> and you know when I write, did, did you to say theorem? These are formal series. These are formal dual numbers. Uh, but it well, sounds like you're not presenting a ring then, but you're presenting like an algebra over the dual numbers or something. I think, let's see, does it end up being an algebra over the dual numbers? Um, a ring over the I, dual I, numbers. I, uh, uh, does, does it? I mean, uh, there's so many twists here. I'm not <laughs> sure that's the right way to think of it. Uh, well, I'm willing to I let mean, you right. go, but I'm, I'm a little... I, I get the basic idea, but I get confused because. Well, let, let me try to write it a little bit better. It's like you you know, the real to... numbers, and then just adjoin x one and x d, and y one and y d, and that's it. And then, you know, I put I I I put in the equations that say that, you know. That x one, I, I, yeah, I'm really tempted to write it this way. It's x one, sorry, x one plus x sub d times d squared plus. Well, I mean, what 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 I originally wrote that you know, y one. Okay, but where did you get? How did you get to use this d in the relations when it wasn't in the generators? It's because you're what, you're. I know you're saying it's a formal thing, but anyway, yeah. am I supposed to just not bother you and just say like, "Hey, you can formalize." No, 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 no. You are supposed to bother me. You are, you are supposed to bother me. But like, I could, I could, I could, I could, I could understand this if you said like, "This is a presentation of a algebra over the dual numbers." Then, 
the generators don't have to mention D, but and the relations are allowed to involve. No, but haven't you ever seen somebody like write some equations between a bunch of variables by making those variables the coefficients of some sort of series and then saying that the series you know the, the, uh, obeys some sort of or some bunch of series uh, obey some sort of algebraic relations and then that is interpreted as equations applying to the coefficients right I mean, I've definitely you, seen I, that. I'm not, maybe I'm not describing this the right way, but that's something people do all the time in certain Yeah, times. well, that's... And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm appealing to that method of yeah. notation. I may be doing... Okay, but it seems like you're that. also like, you're using that method, but then you're like also saying like these series have only two terms in them. So that D squared is equal to zero when you manipulate these series. So that's like part of the rule. That, that's that, that. No, that's completely Short true. Series. That's completely true. That's, okay, that, that's completely true. Um, okay, you're fine. No, I'm happy now. I, I <laughs> you somehow got me to accept that this is sort of like a. I don't know what a kind of notational trick or something like that. That's a, a typical. There's actually a lot more to say about this, but I was trying to skip over it. But 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 right. Maybe it is actually worth s s saying a little bit about. See, like. What's really going on here is that the dual numbers is better than just a commutative ring. It's actually the dual of a co-ring. And so, <laughs> ah, <laughs> see, Right. I mean, this is what you were talking about last week when you mentioned how, you know, the dual numbers is tiny in a certain sense. Uh-huh. Or it's depending on how you think about it, it's spectrum. I mean, spec D is a co-ring. That's what you meant by that's another way to say what you meant. Um is that right? Let's you might see. say like spec like a co-ring. Is it the other way well, around? The way to think about a co-ring is like a ring object in in schemes yeah the, uh, right the, the, there is something like that going on here there is something like that going on here um yes yes but what am i trying to say here that yeah but there's a but 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 a co a, a co-commutative co-ring is like a really nice example of a um of one of these ring objects in in schemes one of these rings commutative ring schemes um <laughs> uh, there's a whole lot more to say about this but uh, maybe we shouldn't really try to say all of that today okay. um yeah it's very tempting to try to go into all the detail that you bring up up here i didn't i didn't quite catch that you you were going into that level of that you were trying to get us to go into that level of detail at first that's why i wasn't quite following what you were talking about but th there's yeah there's some really nice stuff to say about this but it involves getting going into more detail but whereas what i what i want to do right now i guess is not to go into that more detail but instead just to make the analogy here to say that we're doing something very analogous now but with the two rig of vector spaces of, of the, the two rig of eisenstein vector spaces that's the thing that's playing the role of taking over the role that was played by the dual numbers so in other words we've got we, we you know we've got this in in this case, T in this example, T is going to be the T is sorry. Let me see if I get this to work. Draw. Okay, T is going to be uh, the theory of uh a line object L with 
with uh, a, a trivialization of its third tensor power. Uh -huh. So it's like this. But now we're simply going to say, take a model of that theory, or we're, we're going to sketch a sketch. We're going to sketch a new theory. We're a model of the new theory. A model of the new theory is a model of the old theory, but in this alternative universe, you know, this alternative universe where the objects, instead of being vector spaces, are now Eisenstein vector spaces. Uh huh. So, this really is an example of exponentiation. And, 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 and again, it sort of depends on the Eisenstein, the category of Eisenstein vect, vector spaces as being a tiny two rig in the same way that oh. the, the dual numbers was a tiny commutative ring. Are so, vector um, spaces over any field? Say that again? Are vector spaces over any field a tiny two rig? Can I think about that? Let me think about it. Uh, if I haven't screwed up, then I think that that is correct. I think, that, well, in fact, uh, 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 let me try to give a tiny little hint here about how that's going to work. <laughs> so, It, and, and yeah, this is something that's supposed to work pretty similarly in between the decategorified case and the categorified case. So what's actually good about the dual numbers is that it's underlying vector space as an adjoint object, you know, a dual object, but dual in the sense of being an adjoint object. So for example, something that's not tiny is, you know, polynomials in one variable or something like that. Because the underlying, well, if you're even if you're working over a field, the underlying vector space of that polynomials in one variable will be an infinite dimensional vector space. Mm -hmm. And that has a dual, but it doesn't have that dual is not. It's not the strong kind of dual. It's not the adjoint kind of dual. Uh huh. Right? There is a. It's not a dualizable object in the jargon they use these days. Yeah, I'm not sure I like that jargon, but yes, whatever jargon would, would will work for you. That yes, we, we, we need the jargon that says that it's, you know, that, that the object has an adjoint object. So, I mean, right, right roughly speaking, we can say that. Um, when you have a vector space and it's dual vector space, we're always going to get, I think, the sort of what looks like the co-unit of injunction, uh, right? The pairing, I hope I'm getting this in the correct Yeah, way. that sounds right, yeah. The, the pairing between a vector space and its dual is, is like a co-adjoint. Sorry, co-adjunct, co-unit. Co it's like the co-unit for an adjunction. Right. But what's missing is a unit for that adjunction. Right. Right. That would be like a sort of trace thing or something. Uh, you, you know what I mean? Like a bit a trace form or something like that. I mean, it'd well, be like a thing, a thing going from the unit object. That, but, uh, what do you call that? I don't know, but anyway, it's. Yeah, it'd be like a code. I could write down a formula for it, which would involve an infinite sum in the, I mean, if you try to cook it up explicitly in the infinite dimensional case, you get an infinite sum of vector, tensor, dual basis vector, and that infinite sum doesn't mean anything. In the That's right. That's right. That's right. So, you know, it's a kind of thing where um, in this decategorified case, Okay. Tininess in this a sense tends to have a lot to do with it, oh, right. finite dimensionality. Oh. Um, 
Now, in, in this categorified case, it's, 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 it's not so clearly a matter of finite dimensionality anymore, but it still is a matter of whether the underlying thing of the two rig, whether that has an adjoint or not. And I think the example that you just asked about, it, it does have a, um, uh, in, fact, in fact, I think it would work for modules of any commutative rank. For, any, for modules of any com commuter ring, that's going to have an adjoint. And in fact, it's going to be self-adjoint. So it's actually, in some ways, easier to get these adjoints in the categorified case. It's, it, you know, so tiny objects don't have to be quite so tiny, actually. So, so there's actually some yeah. interesting games you can play that make it easier to get exponents or uh, in the... Um, in the in the categorified case, but um, so yeah, I just wanted to make this. I just wanted to flesh out a little bit this analogy that you that you were uh -huh. that was implicit in what you were asking about last time. Really, I mean, I mean, you you know, you asked about this theory, and then I claimed that well, it's sort of like an analog of an exponential. And so I was just trying to explain what I mean by being an analog of an exponential. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. You didn't write an equal sign after spec T to the spec E. So that's I'm right. That's right. I didn't really have a and then it would, name for it. Okay. Yeah. But basically, it would be this theory that you're describing in this blue box. That's right. That's right. That thing right there. That's right. Okay. Okay. That's right. That's right. It, you know, it just happens in that very famous tangent bundle case that it was a very famous pre-existing thing that people had talked about, bef I think, before people reinterpreted it as a kind of exponential. So um, maybe go to a new page here now. Okay. One thing I just, this is, first, I thought the analogy was stronger than it was because I was thinking that like that the reason why spec E is tiny is that E is tiny. Yeah, I mean, that's a sufficient condition, but I don't think that's necessary. Yeah. Uh -huh. So uh, then it was like, that made me wonder like, what would happen if you did spec T to the spec of D? Would you get like some tangent bundle of a... <laughs> of a of a theory, <laughs> yeah, yes, you do get it. I, I, if, I, if I'm not too badly confused, then you you can take tangent bundles of a the, of a theory in that way. Um, and and you know, so a model of this tangent bundle theory. Wait, well, let's see. When you're writing spec E in the categorified case, yes, that E means the. It's not the Eisenstein numbers anymore. It's the it's the Eisenstein vector spaces. spaces. Yeah, yeah Eisenstein, Eisenstein vector spaces. Right. Yeah. I mean, but there there is a level slip there, which I'm wary about falling into. But let's go ahead and think about it. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, but that's what it is. So so if I stuck spec D in there, I would mean I would mean like a dual number modules, the category of. Yeah, yes. Yes. You could use yes. It, it, yes. To use. Okay. That's right. 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 Yeah. We would use the yes the the modules of the dual numbers. Yeah, and that would still be. Uh -huh. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that would still be tiny in the appropriate sense, or you know, it would have it would have an adjoint in the appropriate sense. What I'm hoping this yeah. could just be completely stupid, but what I'm hoping is that like if you did that with spec D, yeah. it would have some connection to deformation theory, like oh, oh yeah, no, it would. First order Absolutely. deformations of you'd have like a new theory whose models would be like first order deformations of your original theory or something. That's like. right. That's right. And this should work fine. And I think you know people may not do it in this language, but I think people do that all the time. Mm -hmm. I okay. think, think that's right. So that's that's a perfectly good idea. Okay, that's cool. Okay, I'll give you your. I'll reward you. <laughs> okay. okay. Okay, so you know I'm aiming for like you know another fifteen minutes here, or something like that, fifteen uh -huh. or twenty minutes. And um, I'm going to try to say in a very preliminary way, I'm going to finally try to 
respond to things you've been asking about, about where do the reciprocity laws come in in these, these games that we're playing? So, so that's, uh -huh. that's what I'm going to try to say something about now. Um, like I said, it's going to be very preliminary, uh, partially because I didn't, you know, get that much of a chance to really work a whole bunch of details out yet. But I, I, I hope it's going to be give us a, a good preliminary picture to to build on. So what am I trying to say here? So, well, so a classic example that we're supposed to apply this to is a situation like a Z mod three torzer. over the rationals. And yeah, we're supposed to get something sort of like a reciprocity law out of this or something like that. So what am I trying to say here? What am I, what am I trying to say that we should do here? Right, since this is preliminary, I'm gonna make some you know oversimplifications and things like that. But what am I going to try to do here? I want to say something like that. Well, okay, <laughs> right. One of the ways I'm going to cheat here is I'm going to sort of vacillate about whether this is really living over the rationals or whether it's living over the integers. Because if it was living over the integers, Z, then I could push these torsors push such a torsor forward to, you know, to, um, to the integers modulo prime. Uh-huh. <clears throat> now, I can't quite do that with, um, with the rationals, right? Because, I mean, there's a homomorphism going here. No. And, yeah. But, you know, the, the two arrows are sort of lined up, not quite the right direction to compose them. So how do you deal with that? Well, there's various ways you can try to get around this problem. You can try to pretend that this really is an invertible arrow or something like that. Um, you can think a lot about ramification. You can, you, can you can try to redo everything that we were doing over the rationals. You can try and redo it over the integers. That would be fun to do at some point because sure it's good to do anyway <laughs> sure but i think the, the, the way we're going to deal with it at this preliminary stage is we're just going to absolutely cheat we're just going to kind of pretend that we don't have to to worry about it and and uh, you know we actually do have to worry about it it's going to cause these ramification issues and things like uh -huh. that but um and but right i mean sometimes people right there are there are there are all sorts of philosophies that people use to deal with this problem. And there's probably a lot of philosophies that people use that I don't really like. Um, you know, so I, I need to work out my own philosophy that I do like. But in the meanwhile, right, I mean, I think, right, I think some people sort of, right, some people almost act like there is something going on here, but it's right to think in terms of except for a few, <laughs> except for some problems here and there. Well, but what am I trying to say? They work. Into, they think of this as a global field, I think, and they think of this as like a local field or something like that. Or maybe they think of the piatic down here or something like that. And they think of the completions of mm -hmm. this global, the local completions of this global field or something like that. Uh -huh. and there's a, a philosophy that works in terms of that. I, I, I'm not sure how much I like that philosophy. Maybe it's a great philosophy and I just don't understand it yet. Or maybe I'll still not really like that philosophy even after I understand it. Um, I'm not sure how puristically Tanakhian that philosophy really is in, this, in, this, in, in the sense of what I mean by Tanakhian. Um, but yeah, so I, I've, for, for now, I'm just going to kind of paper this over. I'm just going to kind of pretend that we can get away with this. So what I'm trying to say is that 
yeah, it, we're, we're, we're going to act like we can push forward a torsor that was over the integers or perhaps over the rationals. We can push forward to being a torsor of the same group, so still a Z mod 3 torsor, but now over this finite field. And we can do that for all, you know, all primes in the world. Well, in this case, we're thinking of all ordinary primes, all the primes, you know, of the rational field or of the integer ring. Um, so you know, two, three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so we do that to some individual torsor, and we hope to see a pattern in which torsors we get when we push it forward to finite fields. So in order to have any hope of understanding such a pattern, you have to have some idea what the torsors are over the finite field. Mm -hmm. Now, right, we've given sort of a prescription for understanding torsors over a number field. And finite fields are, again, we're cheating here, but the finite fields are enough like that. Again, like, right, right we, we, we hinted <laughs> learn more about Mashka's theorem or something like that to understand how much difference or how little difference there is in understanding uh -huh. these torsors over the finite fields compared to these torsors over like the number fields or something like that. Yeah, probably all hell will break loose when P equals three, but other primes will be not so weird. That's right. As long as, you know, we don't care if there's some, you know, huge number, huge finite number of exceptions that we have to throw out. We just care if there's an infinite number of non-exceptions like <laughs> okay. um, or a co-finite collection of non-exceptions. Um, That's what I use when I'm trying to convince Lisa that I'm making the bed. Sure, sure. Uh, but, but, uh, but uh, you know, the, the reason, I, I, I don't, I mean, it's because we're being sloppy, because that's we're being very that's sloppy. Fine. That's exactly your situation too, exactly. Uh, but it's, it's because we're being so sloppy and preliminary that we're willing to just sweep any finite number of exceptions under the carpet. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, well, so it, I think it's I think it should be really interesting to try to, you know, take all the sketching that we've done of the theories and that we've applied to understanding what the models are like over the finite field over the number fields. It should be interesting to apply that to the finite fields instead and get very concrete, explicit descriptions of what the torsors are like over the finite fields. And that will get us started. It's one way to get us started. On the road towards understanding the reciprocity theorem. Uh -huh. Great. But I think we're actually going to try a different approach that's going to like magically avoid having to, to think about that. Again, I'm not sure it's a good idea not to think about that, but we're going to, there may be a way that we can sort of avoid. There may be a, 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 a way we could sort of magically avoid even thinking about what very explicitly about what these torsors are like, and we'll just get magical answers that will that we can exploit. So what do I mean by this? So what I'm trying to say is this. See, what if, what if a field had a generic torsor over it? I mean, that right, that would be sort of like saying that you knew what the fundamental group of that spectrum of that field was. Right, so in other words, if, if, if <laughs> right? I mean, right, we're, again, we're using all sorts of analogies between Galois groups and fundamental groups, right? We're yeah. supposed to, Arithmetic and geometry, we're supposed to think of, you know, homotopy theoretic pictures, mental pictures of things that are going on here. So what am I trying to say that you know, supposing you had 
k is a field and suppose the generic torsor over the spectrum of k or over k depending on how you think of it supposing it was a g torsor you know supposing this were a sort of like the the universal torsor over k in a certain sense right we have to clarify in what sense what we're talking about but we mean the sense that you know it's sort of like we're saying that g is supposed to be the fundamental group of the spectrum of k uh -huh. yep. that sense so let's pretend for a moment that we did have something like that working mm -hmm. if we had something like that working then it would give us a, a shortcut to avoid even having to think about what the torsors of other groups are like over K. And let, let's see if I can get straight which direction it, it, it's <laughs> yep. going to point in right. and w whether or not that's going to help us. Not, now I'm suddenly having nightmares that the arrow is going to point the wrong way and won't be able to get it to work. So let's see. We're trying to say that if you had, you know, some G prime torsor over K that wasn't universal, it would, it should, you know, have a comparison map to the universal one. I'm betting it goes yeah. from G to G prime. Or... That's right. I think that's what I want. <clears throat> I think that's right. Let's um, let, let, let me grab onto that life preserver. And um and try and exploit that. Okay. Okay. And then I'm going to further try to exploit a sort of grand claim about what are the universal torsors for all finite fields in the world. Mm -hmm. And yes. base, yeah, you want to say something? Uh, probably like the finite completion of Z. It's like the Frobenia. The yeah, it's something like that. Or just right, right. Just it's something like that. Uh -huh. That's right. That's right. There's this magic Frobenius thing, which is very explicit because it's like the Heath power map or something like that. So it's 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 a very explicit. It it it, it exists very explicitly and uniquely as a an automorphism of these universal things that live over the finite field these universal these algebraic completions of the of the finite field which are yeah something like that huh? and um yeah right and as you say right so did, did i i mean you said for Venus, did i say it out loud that this you know for Venus thing is this magic explicit thing this peace power map mm -hmm uh that generates these universal or progressively universal things that approximate the universal uh towards or over here so so right so if 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 we're both understanding each other what each other is saying sufficiently then it sounds like i think what we're saying is that to give a G prime torsor over K, basically you just have to give an element of G prime and you call that the Frobenius element of G prime. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, if you know, you, 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 right, you want, you want, you want to make like a, you don't, you don't want to just have a set of G torsors. You don't want to just classify them into a set of G torsors, G prime torsors, but you could also, well, one thing you can do is make it into a groupoid of G prime torsors. Mm -hmm. And um, and so uh, basically you just, for that purpose, you mostly just want to know what are the automorphisms of a given G prime torsor. So we've specified a, a particular G prime torsor by giving an element of G prime. That's a G prime torsor over this finite field that we're thinking about. So we give, we have that element of G prime, and then we just take its centralizer. And that is the automorphism group of that torsor, I think. Doesn't that make sense if I didn't screw up? 
I guess so. I guess you're right, Kim. You know, and then if G prime was abelian, then further special things would happen. We'd be in the stable range and you could like tensor torsors together or something like that. And there'd be all sorts of uniformity <laughs> and- uh, All sorts of what? All sorts of uniformity to the, mm -hmm. to the automorphism groups of all the objects or something like that by translation symmetry or something like that. But uh, in a way, it would also be boring, right? It'd be, you know, the, the stable range in some sense where things are magically easy to calculate, but also sort of boring for the same reason. Uh, but yeah, so, so, and I guess, right. And I guess we are gonna be thinking in that range. We're gonna be dealing with situations where Right, I guess eventually we're anticipating cases where G prime really is non abelian, and then we might be exploring non abelian class field theory or the Langlands program or something like that. But to begin with, for understanding the classical reciprocity theorems, we really are thinking about the boring, easy case where G prime is abelian. Uh huh. Good. And I guess in that case, the centralizer is the whole abelian group, I guess. So the automorphism mm -hmm. groups are big. I don't really have anything interesting to say about the Ormarsum group, but it's interesting that they're there. Um, so, so, right. So now we're imagining, you know, G is an abelian group. Let's say a finite abelian group. You know, might could as well be a profinite abelian group, but let's just say it's a finite abelian group. Uh, finite abelian group. G is a finite abelian group. And we have like this G torsor X over, uh, let's say over some number field, but for example, over the the rationals, although again, it's sort of ambiguous whether we might want to think of this as living over the rationals or living over the integers, but we're not worrying about fine distinctions like that at the moment. So we have this G towards a X over the rationals. And then for each prime, we're going to more or less push forward X to get the push forward of X over, you know, Z mod P. So I don't know, maybe I call it X sub, Z mod P or something like that. Maybe we should just call it X sub P or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be classified by an element of G. Right? So we're, we're sort of getting a map from primes to elements of G or something like that. Huh. That's nice. That yes. seems good. Yes, and 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 you know, since we're sort of running out of time here, let's just try to you know make a semi pretend punchline out of this. So we're trying to say that this function that we're going to get that came from this G torsor X, remembering that G is an abelian group. Maybe I should call should have called it A instead of G, and it's a finite abelian group. Um, it's it's going to produce this g valued function on the primes and we're kind of we you know we're interested in what kind of function that is and also we're interested in whether we can recover the torsor x from this function uh this function that you know takes in a prime and puts out an uh -huh. element of g and the punchline is supposed to be that yeah we're going to get nice answers to those questions we are going to be able to recover X up to isomorphism from this function. And furthermore, this function is going to satisfy some very simple congruence patterns. We should be able to say very explicit what these congruence patterns are. And yeah, and, and, and right, in many ways, we should be able to say explicitly what these congruence patterns are. So for example, Right when we were doing these, this example of Z mod three, we were able to, according to what we've been saying, 
we, we've been, we, are, we are in principle able to classify the Zedmod three torsors by saying, you know, what cube root you're taking, what, what cube root inv it involves taking, mm -hmm. what cube root of what Eisenstein number is involved in, yep. in this torture. And, and in particular, there's a nice answer in that picture. So we're saying there's a, there's a nice way you can read off from, you know, you, you have this number that you're taking a cube root of, and you read off from that number, and it's a, again, it's an Eisenstein number, you read off from that number um, the congruence pattern. And it's going to be very simple, you know, maybe this is we'll, what we'll try to do next time or something like that. Great. No, I want to do it. No. <laughs> I've, been, well, I've been dying for something that looks like something that's sort of in the vicinity of art and reciprocity. So this is like... This is that. This This is my... This is what this is what I think you're at. This I think that's exactly what you're asking for. Here. I think I think what what you know. If we work that out, that's exactly. I think. I mean, we should really try to check this, try to compare yep. it to the textbook ways of just saying this. But I think we're giving equivalent information to the art and reciprocity theorem when we work this out. When we see how to, you know, take these very explicit descriptions of the torsors, and turn those into these very simple, turn these in a very straightforward way into these functions from primes to elements of G that, um, that satisfy a very simple congruence pattern. And again, and, and then again, it's, you know, I, I think it's very fun to start imagining what's, what it's going to be like in the case where G is non-abelian. So in the case where G is non-abelian, right, this Frobenius element is not really going to be defined, totally defined. It's going to be defined up to conjugacy. So we're actually going to have a function from primes to conjugacy elements of G. But anyway, that's jumping ahead to the non-abelian case and the Langlands stuff and things like that. But um I'm hoping this is sort of like a reasonable place to quit. I'm, I'm hoping, you, hoping you can sort of see what I'm saying here. I mean, this, you know, next time we have to actually try to work this out, but I'm hoping you can sort of see what we're trying to do here. And yeah, this is a great place to end. It's like you want a TV series to end each episode with something that makes people want to. Sure. Come I, this is like come a promise about something that's going to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is like. We owe it to somebody now. I owe it to you, I guess. Yeah, you owe it to me. <laughs> <laughs> or else I have to figure it out myself. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, that sounds that sounds like it could be comprehensible more than most. Yeah, I think it's really say about art and reciprocity. And that's what I've always been hoping you would eventually come up with. <laughs> yeah, I think it's right. I think it's I think it's gonna be really easy. I was ex even expecting to do some of the you know numerics of it today. And then I just got totally lost when I was trying to figure out certain things pre preparing for today's discussion. But, <laughs> but I, 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 yeah, I, I think, I think, I think this is a real good chance we'll fulfill this promise next time or very soon. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot. Okay. I'll quit now. Okay. I'll see you. Yeah.